Right, good morning. All right, my name is Walt Tanner. We're the pastors here at Capstone. And uh, like we heard from Carly and from Anna, uh, so glad you guys have joined us. There's a lot of places you could be right now. Uh, you could be at home. You could be in your bed. You could be at the lake. And some of you are all in those places and you're watching online. So we're glad that you're watching online as well. But we, I pray that we would never take for granted the opportunity to, to join together, whether it's through technology online or whether it is here in person, um, God, that, that God has given us this opportunity and that we would, ta- we would seize it. And so, uh, again, as we kind of continue through this pandemic, uh, we're glad you guys came in. Thank you guys for, we, again, we've kind of adjusted some things for coffee, again, uh, contactless. We're not giving out programs and stuff, so make sure if you don't have the Capstone app, you could go to the App Store right now. You go ahead and download that uh, and through uh, Google or through iTunes, and you have a message map there. If you click on Sermon Notes, and you can follow right along, or you can uh, freehand it and uh, go just with a blank journal. But uh, if you are our Camp Rockers, we've invited our Camp Rockers in here. Uh, hopefully, we'll give you a launch date of we well, got a date on the calendar when Camp Rock's going to open up. We'll hear about that soon. But Camp Rockers, uh, today if you're filling out your SOAP, Scripture, Observation, Application, Prayer. The Scripture's going to be Daniel 1. We're going to start in 8 and go all the way to 21. So you go ahead and write that down. So uh, we are continuing our Daniel series. And uh, really, we've been looking at what it looks like to be caught behind enemy lines. And the idea of this Babylonian empire that comes in and takes uh, the nation of Israel uh, captive. And so if you're new to church or new uh, to the Bible, whether here in person or you're online, uh, let me just kind of take a few minutes to explain what's going on. So um, Israel, remember, is God's chosen people. He's established them as a nation. Uh, They have their own strip of land there uh, in the Middle East. Well, God says in Deuteronomy 28, as long as you follow my ways, as long as you follow uh, and worship me and me alone, don't go worship these pagan idols and pagan gods and listen to these nations around you, then we are good. But the moment you think you're God and I'm not, you think you're better than, that you figure, got to figure it out more than the one who's created the world, then there will be judgment. There will be captivity. There will be war. You will lose war. So God is, uh, it says in Daniel 1 verse 2, it says that God handed Israel over to this pagan king. Now, we would think God would never want to do that. Why? But remember, he's being faithful to what he told Israel in Deuteronomy 28. He says, as long as you are faithful, guess what? Man, things will be good. But the moment that you take your eyes off of me, judgment will come. So God is simply being faithful. Yes, they lose this battle. But in the end, we know that God wins the war because ultimately they will come out of captivity. They will rule by the city. They, that we will see the line of David produce the Messiah, which will be Christ, and Christ will defeat Satan, defeat Satan, sin, and death through the resurrection. So we know that they lose this battle, judgment comes, but God is still in control. And that's what Daniel's trying to tell us. Daniel is a prophet. If you're not familiar with Old Testament prophets, that means that God speaks to them, and then they are the voice of the Lord. So we see Daniel kind of tell the story of the captivity and of his friends, and kind of how God shows up and shows out in Babylon. And then the last half is actually a prophecy of the end times. And so remember, we've talked about this at Christmas time, that prophecy becomes a uh, reality, um, and that we get to see that through the Old Testament in Christ's coming, and that there is more prophecy prophecy that will become reality when Christ returns again. So that's the last half of Daniel, which we're actually not going to be diving into that during this city, so during this series. So last week we talked about how if we're going to thrive in Babylon, the five characteristics from, from Daniel and his three friends, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is that we, we got to have obedience, we got to have endurance, we got to have perspective, we've got to have courage, we got to have confidence, and that reveals whether we have a genuine faith that stands the test of time, that, t- that stands the test of fire and storm versus counterfeit faith that so many of other the Jews who were taken into captivity like them, that their faith just kind of fades away and we don't hear about any of them. So what does that look like in our life? Because we say we are living in a modern day Babylon because we've talked about this, that we now live in, we're living in a post-Christian society. We are no longer a Christian nation. That Christian ways and uh, a biblical worldview are, are the minority now, that we are losing power. We are losing our voice. We are losing our quote unquote rights. So what is it like for us to be that minority? Because most of the American nation in the history was that we were a quote unquote a Christian nation, but that's not the case anymore. So what does that mean for us as the church? And that's why we're studying this because I believe it's so um, prevalent today. So let's look at Daniel 1.8. So we're going to look at Daniel 1.8 really quick. And then we're going to just kind of process. Uh, if you're writing down a sermon title, is simply this, Hope in Babylon. 
hope in Babylon. So when things are against us, when things are dark, when we're living in this pagan nation, when we continue to lose rights and we continue to say people aren't winning elections that we want to win elections, what does that look like? So how do we have hope during this time? So here we go. Uh, Daniel 1, 8. It says, but Daniel resolved, another translation puts determined. So we're going to use that, those two words. But Daniel resolved or determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs uh, about to allow him not to defile himself. So you might be, again, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, God in the beginning of the Bible gives a bunch of laws to the nation of Israel, his people. He says, look, you can have certain food and you can't have this certain food. Some of it was for their own protection. When people go back and read uh, what God told them not to eat, they're like, yeah, that's probably pretty good uh, not to eat that. Uh, some things are more of a... Uh, pagan uh, offered to other gods. Uh, one of the things that we know a lot about is that they're not able to eat pork, uh, and so there was no bacon. I know that's why we love Jesus so much. He has freed us from that. We can have bacon now. So, um, so the idea is that they are not able to eat that certain food. Um, and some of you may know this. It's, it's called the law is called kosher. The idea that it is kosher, a kosher meal for for a Jew. And the idea of that word kosher comes from the word to be pure or proper. So the law was that everything would to be, to be, was to be kosher, which is to be pure or uh, proper. And so the idea that he knows he's coming from the king's table, which means there's probably going to be, um, well, it's a king, so he's going to have bacon. And so there's going to be bacon and barbecue and ribs. There's going to be all that stuff on it. And there's also probably going to be other meat. There's going to be ca- there's going to be cattle that was offered to pagan gods. So he knows that if he, if he takes part of food from the king's table, it is going to defile him and all the other Jews who take part in it. So he, he draws this line in the sand. And he asks the, the chief eunuch, he says, hey, is there any way um, that I not take part in that? And, and actually, I've got some three buddies who, who, who don't want to do that either. And, and the guy's like, he actually, David... Daniel had, had gained favor with him. He's like, dude, I love you. Like, you're great. I've, we've, we've joked. We've played space together. Like, we've hung out together. Like, I really like you, but here's the deal. I, would, I wouldn't really mind. I don't really care. It's not me. But here, if I put you before the king and you look healthy and you've lost weight and, you're not, and, you're, and you don't look good, it's not your head that rolls. It's mine. He says, so Daniel, as much as I would like to help you and your friends, I don't think I can do that. Now, right there, Daniel has a choice. Daniel could go back to God and say, God, look, I tried. God, I tried to do what you want me to do, and, and there's no way around it, so I guess I'm going to get to eat bacon. Like, there's no other way around it. Or he could have got mad and protested, and he could have said, I can't believe you're not going to let me do that. I'm right. You're wrong. But he doesn't. He says, all right, God, well, let's see if there's another way around this. Okay, the frontal attack did not work. I went and asked the, the, the boss of the bosses, so let me go see if I can ask the guy who actually brings me my food. And so he goes and he asks the guy who brings him his, fo- his food. And, and so now we're going to jump into 12. And this is what verse 12 says as he's talking to um, the servant who's bringing him the food. He says, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed to you and deal with your servants according to your will. So he listened to them and this matter, and he tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the day, 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and their wine, and they were able to, to drink and gave them vegetables. So here we see Daniel come, and he's putting himself out there, and he says, look, all right, so you didn't want to try it. Because, you know, you could be responsible. Okay, I understand that. Let's do this. Ten days. Just let's do ten days and you decide. And you know what? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But give me ten days and let's see what happens. You be the judge. So this is how he kind of comes around. And he basically says, all right, God, I'm going to go this route. God, I'm giving you an opportunity to, to bless and to, uh, for us to be faithful to, to what's going on here. Now, I think the American church needs to take notice of how he deals with this in this modern-day Babylon where he doesn't have power, he's a captive, he doesn't have voting rights, he doesn't have any of that stuff. And so as he comes before them, he, the way he approaches authority is with humility and grace. Humility and grace, he comes and asks, okay, all right, the first time didn't work, let's try this way. And, and that's where he gains influence. He didn't stomp and pout because he didn't get his way 
He, he didn't cross his arms or lock his doors and go, I'm never going out there again, or I'm not having dinner with them ever again, or there's no way I can hang out with them anymore because, because they don't vote like me, or, or they're talking different than me, or they don't have the same belief in, in, in the way that I believe marriage should look, or they don't have the same belief about abortion, then I can't hang out with them anymore. But he shows grace and compassion and humility and says, all right, well, let's, let's, let's have this conversation. Let's look at it this way. And I think in our modern day Babylon, I think we have to work in that. Because here's the deal. The hope for Daniel was not that he hopes this works. It wasn't wishful thinking. His hope was in the Lord. His hope was in the Lord. Okay, God, here's the deal. I, I'm going to take this. And my hope, God, is that, that we're able to, that you're going to rise to the top. That I'm going to give an opportunity. I'm going to step out in obedience. And God, I'm going to give you an opportunity to just bless me. I'm going to give you the opportunity to work a miracle. God, I'm going to give you the opportunity for some hearts to be changed. And I'm gonna give you that. And my hope is in you. It's not in wishful thinking. But he go, ultimately, he, he goes before because he knew being in Babylon didn't make him a pagan. But if he allowed Babylon to get in him, then it would define his very, defile his very soul. And some of us need to hear that because some of us are we're so caught up in playing defense but the idea of going, man, what is it like for us to humbly, compassionately, grace-filled, begin to build relationships with people who the Lord wants to impact? Because, yes, he draws a line in the sand. He says, you could take me from Jerusalem and put me in Babylon. You could take my, my God-given Israel holy name and give me a pagan name. You could send me to pagan school and, and learn all about your false gods. You can, I can do all that, but here's where I'm going to draw the line. I'm not going to allow Babylon to get in me. All that other stuff is surface. It doesn't matter where I live. It doesn't matter what I learn. Those are all things. Those are all outward things. He says, but I'm not going to allow Babylon to get in me. He takes a stand and allows the Lord to show up. And that's really what we want to talk about today. Now, as we stand in this modern day Babylon, what is it like for you to take a stand? And, and I would ultimately point you to Romans 12, 1 and 2, which is our next scripture we're going to uh, dive into. And I would say, you need to memorize this. If you don't know the scripture, if you've never heard the scripture, underline it, highlight it, write it on a card, put it on your mirror, put it on your screensaver. Like this is a scripture in modern day Babylon that we have to have because I believe this is one that Daniel would have held on to um, if he had had it. But it simply says this. It says, I appeal to you brothers. Remember, this is Paul. He's writing from a prison in Rome. And so he is in the same situation. So he says, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, that your bodies are a part of that worship. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. So ultimately, that's what plays out in Daniel's life and his friends, is that he has this, this, this act that says, okay, Give me the willingness to see what's good and acceptable to the Lord. Give me the discernment of what God wants me to do and what God does not want me to do. You know what? Change my name. That's okay. I'll go live in Babylon. I'm not going to protest. Go to Babylon University. Guess what? But God gave him and put it in his heart and said, look, I don't want you to be conformed in what they eat and what they drink. I want you to stand firm in that. And they say, okay. And today we're going to talk about that, that we're all going to have to have lines and drawn in the sand, that some of you are conformed to this world more than me. And there are things that in my life, I have to draw lines in the sand. And that's the beauty of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit inside of us will transform us and he will give us discernment of what we need to not be conformed to this world, but allow to be transformed by the hope in Jesus. So that's what we want to talk about today. What does that look like? And scripture gives us really reality, a, a way to perfect this. It's something that my grandmother used to tell me, garbage in and garbage out, all right? My grandma used to say, if you take, if, well, if you take garbage in, guess what's going to come out? Garbage, all right? But in our soul, remember what he says, just because he was, a, he was living in a pagan time, as long as he didn't ingest this unclean food, then he felt like it was going to purify his heart and soul. Now, some of the religious leaders in Jesus' day get caught up in that, and they believe, oh, you ate bad things, and Jesus says, no, no, no. Now that I've come, don't get caught up in that. What you do need to get caught up is in how are you conforming to the world? How are, how, how are you becoming like everybody else? Or how are you being transformed by Jesus and standing out? 
So garbage in and garbage out. So he knew that being in a pagan culture didn't make him a pagan. Jesus is the same thing. Jesus leaves heaven. He comes and he lives in a sinful, broken, muck and mire of this world, but that doesn't make him a sinner. And so for, for some of you, you're working in a job right now, and you're like, man, it's so toxic, it's so dark, it's so pagan. Maybe God wants me to leave. Maybe someone gets a promotion over you and they're an atheist and they don't believe in God. And you're like, you know what? If I, if I stay here, then that's gonna make me less of a Christian. God might be saying, no, no, this is, I want you here because you are a Christian. We have to shift our mindset of going, maybe God has me in this neighborhood. Maybe God has me in this class. Maybe God has me on that team. Maybe God has me on that hall. Maybe God has me there and you're surrounded by pagans and God might go, well, this is where I need you in order to put you in a place. Now, there's some lines you might need to draw. You may not need to go out with them when they go out on Friday night. You may need, not need to go out after work with some of them. Or you may need to separate some distance in there, but I'm going to give you wisdom and discernment in that. But don't run away just because it's dark. God said, I need you to go. I need you as sons and daughters to go in and lean in that. First, uh, first John um, 2, you can write that down. First John 2, you go back, and, and this is what John writes. He says, he says, to be in the world, but not of the world. Be in the world, not of the world. Too many of us as Christ followers, if you put us up against someone who's lost and look at our lives, look at our banking accounts, look at our time, look at the way we spend our, our evenings, look at what we do in the mornings, our lives really don't look that different. And if we're really honest, we're really, we're in the world and we are of the world. And the Holy Spirit needs to convict us of that and that we need to look different in what that, in what that looks. So we ingest from our culture where God has placed us. So we need to be very careful of what we ingest now, I don't want to, again, I'm not going to give you a list of rules. You can't watch rated R movies. You can't go to somewhere who serves beer or alcohol. You can't do that. That's not, that's not what I'm doing. That's not what I'm telling you. What I am telling you is whatever you struggle with and whatever that ingestion conforms you, then that's what you need to pay attention to. You need to acknowledge your weaknesses and draw that line. You need to memorize Romans 12, 1 and 2, that I would present my body as a living sacrifice in order that I would have discernment of what's holy and presentable, that I wouldn't be conformed to this world, but I'd be transformed by the hope in Jesus Christ. So what is it that God gives you discernment in? What is God giving you wisdom in that you need to say, okay, here's where I need to draw the line. Here's a couple of examples. For some of you, it's just like Daniel, it's food. That we as Americans, just really honest, have an unhealthy dependence on food the rest of the world, majority of the rest of the world, they, they eat to live. And we in America, we live to eat, baby. When is the next meal? Some of you are already thinking about what's for lunch. Like you're already thinking about what's for lunch. We, we live to eat. And eat. If the, the, many of us have traveled the world and we've been able to go to other cultures. And you're like, why is this not a lot of food on here? Or, you know, if you've been to Haiti and Pastor Andy came to, to here, who's our Haitian pastor friend, who our partner in Haiti, and, and he went to Golden Corral and he was just like, what in the world is this? <laughs> pastor, this is called a buffet. He's like, is this in the Bible somewhere? Because I'm pretty sure this is, but he actually got sick because of all the food he ingested because his body was not used to all of that. And so we have an unhealthy, um, I joke, but we do have an unhealthy uh, view of food and we self-medicate. And honestly, I'm gonna be real, we depend on food to make us better more than the Lord. That you run to the pantry, not scripture when you feel depressed. <laughs> that you run for that self-medication. And this is just like in Daniel. Going, Daniel goes, you know what? It would be easy to drink the wine and to drink the meat. And man, the cell next door, that bacon smells really good, but I'm just gonna go back to my vegetables and go back to my water. Because would, the Lord told him to draw that line. It was like for us that we begin to say, and again, and preachers are the worst. We'd yell at you for having a beer, but then we'll go eat all you can eat ch uh, chicken fingers, right? I mean, that's one of the biggest hip hypocrisies in, in, in church world. And the idea of going, no, we have to be able to draw the line. What is it that, that we need to not be conformed to the rest of the world? And again, for some of us, it's what we watch. We ingest the words and the ways of the world, and we watch things. And we're like, well, everybody else is watching it, therefore I can watch it. And we need to be very careful of what we ingest because of garbage in and garbage out. And so if we are bringing in garbage of what we're watching and what we're listening to, that will come from our heart. We just need to be very careful of what that looks like because it's going to develop and shape our view of the world. That that's what shapes our world instead of the one who created the world. So be very careful whether it's Netflix or whether it's Hulu or whether it's news media or whether it's social, whatever that is, what you ingest. Are you ingesting negativity because guess what? I can guarantee you that's what you're going to produce is negativity. 
If you soak in the goodness of the Lord and the faithfulness and his righteousness and, and grace, guess what you're going to emit? Goodness and faithfulness and righteousness, the goodness of the Lord. So what are we ingesting? And some of us, just, we, we, we're consumed with what others say, that we ingest the likes and the, and the comments on social media. So we strive to, to make others, we want, that, we want that confirmation from them and we want the world to love us so that we, we go to the world and we go to boyfriends and girlfriends and we go to all these relationships to tell us how good we are and how much they love us. And can I tell you that if you look for love from a hopelessly broken world, you will end up hopelessly broken. That, that you cannot run to the world, that we have to draw a line in the sand and say, you know what? The world is not going to tell me who I am. I am in Jesus, and that's who tells me who I am, not the world. So be very careful that you ingest all the praise from the world, or we ingest all the entertainment of the world, or we even ingest the self-medication, whether it's food or alcohol, or, or all those things are intoxicating, FYI. They're all intoxicating. That's all, uh, that's, that's all gluttony is, is over, overconsumption of things that aren't good for you. Whether it's alcohol or food or likes, that's gluttony. But what does it look like that, that we, we bring in not the things of the pagan culture in the world, but the things of the Lord? That's what Daniel is doing here. That we would take garbage in so that it would shape, get, we would keep the garbage out so that we could be shaped by the world. So that when we are in Babylon, that we would shine bright. So let's keep reading. This is what happens in verse 17. So um, we get all that good stuff, and then we fast. So remember, Daniel, by the way, is writing this not in real time. This is after he kind of lives through all this. Um, and so this is what it says in verse 17. 17 says, as for the four youths, remember uh, that this is for Daniel and Hanani and Michelle and Azariah and all the guys. So it's for use. They gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, all literature and wisdom. It just wasn't veggie tales. It just wasn't Christian literature. Guess what? <laughs> there was Darwinism. <laughs> there was the idea that, that it wasn't Christian thinking. It was pagan. But guess what? They soaked it all in because they said, all right, we'll go to your class, but we know who created the world, not your false gods. We'll go to your class, but you're not going to convince us of anything different. We'll go to your class. So it says they went and they learned. And Daniel had understanding and visions and dreams and the end times when the king had commanded that they should be brought in. The chief of the eunuchs brought them before Nebuchadnezzar. This is the big day. Remember that, that the eunuch wouldn't allow them to do that because of the big day that they're presented before the king. So here comes the day before the king. Dun, dun, dun. And then the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel or Hananiah or Mishael and Azariah. And therefore... He, they stood before the king, and in every manner of wisdom and understanding about the king inquired them, he found them ten times better, ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters or sorcerers that were in all of his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Sirius, Cyrus. So here we see the product of what this looked like. Last week we said obedience was a key to thriving in Babylon. Here we see obedience and staying kosher, staying clean and proper in what they ate. And we talked about endurance last week, that this just is in a few weeks, just in going 10 days. It goes for three years. For three years, they eat this. For three years, they go to class at Babylon U. For three years, they do this. And then they stand before the king. And they pass this test and they go to class and they go to all the routines. They stay faithful to their God. And guess what happens? Even in darkness, even in pagan nations, even surrounded by sorcery and magic and demons themselves, guess what they do when they stay faithful and they have a good uh, perspective and they have courage, they rise up, that God is faithful to rise up. To, to be with them in their suffering, to be with them in their hunger, to be with them in the hypocrisy of the classes that they were sitting and talking about, all these false gods. God was with them. And so they stand out, just not only from the Jews, but they stand out from the Babylonians, from these enchanters and sorcerers and magicians who were probably, if we're really honest, they were probably using de demonic power to do some really crazy stuff. And here we see some people who use the power of the Lord to just simply in obedience. They weren't doing anything wild or crazy. They were just like, man, we went to your class. We learned about your gods. Here's what you told us. Here's what, we'll, we'll vomit what you tell us. They weren't doing anything special. They were just doing what God told them to do. These people who were these, enchan these enchanters and magicians who, quote, unquote, had all the answers, who were superstitious and supernatural. He says, man, you guys are 10 times better than them. 
10 times better than them. It wasn't because they were special. Just they simply did what God told them to do. They were blessed. And I believe that God blesses us in the same manner that they were obedient. And then God goes, man, here's what I'm going to pour out my blessings on you. Here's what I'm going to pour out. And, and for some people, they would see it, the prosperity gospel. So if you just do this and God's going to give you money and you're not going to get sick and you're not going to lose your job, I don't believe that. Because I see that it, what happens to the disciples. I see what happens to Jesus. But I do believe God's going to bless you, maybe with wisdom and discernment. God may bless you with resources. God may bless you with a healthy marriage. God may bless you in, in your kids. And God may bless you in, in all of these things. You still might lose your job. You still might get cancer. You might still have the perseverance to, to help someone else who's been through an addiction like you have. That God's going to bless you and give you opportunities when you walk in obedience. That's how we thrive in Babylon. Not pouting, not yelling, not screaming, but just humbly walking with the Lord. That's where we see the power of that. Remember uh, this big idea that we have for all the series. So this whole series, we'll say this every week. Remember this, is that what happens to you doesn't define you or God. What happens to you does not define you or God. What happens to you does not define you or God. I say that because too many of us today, are we're, we're, we're blaming God. We're defining ourselves as what's happened to us. And God says, I don't, I, that doesn't define you. What I'm going to do in and through you, your response is what's going to define you and the way you look at me. That Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they look at the Lord and go, man, God, you are so faithful. You were faithful that in Deuteronomy 28, guess what? We were handed over as captives. That you are faithful, that you're going to pursue, and we're going to see great things happen because of just simple obedience. They've risen to the top. So when we're living in Babylon, too often we choose either side of the ditches. I talk a lot about ditches, okay? Ditches. I'm going to go ahead and let me emphasize that in case you think I said something different. Ditches, all right? But the idea of going, man, one ditch is this, is going, man, hey, we're, when in Rome, do as the Romans, man, my mama told me I couldn't have no bacon. They told me I can have bacon and I can have good wine. Hey, let's eat it up. Let's just in and Rome do as the Romans do. Many of us go, well, you know what? I grew up in this kind of church. They told me I couldn't do this or they told me I couldn't watch this. Or you know what? Hey, I can do whatever I want to go do now. I've got the blood of Christ. So you know what? I'm going to take advantage of all that and go do it and live like hell. He says, that's not what I redeemed you for. Or the other side is because, you know what, I'm going to get mad, I'm gonna, and I'm going to get salty, and I'm going to cross my arms, I'm not going to hang out with them, and I'm not going to talk to them, and I'm going to pout, and I'm just going to, I'm going to do this and get mad and angry and be known for everything I'm against. Not for the Father who loves them, because God says, I didn't, that neither one of them is the way I want you to respond. I want you to respond in humility. I want you to respond in grace. I want you to respond in obedience and endurance, but in perspective and courage and confidence. I want you to respond in that. Don't have a pity party because you're not in power, but also you don't get to do what you want to do. And we have to, if we're going to thrive in Babylon, here's where we're going to have our hope. Our hope is here because, you know, here's is where Jesus is. This is where we see Jesus dwelling. This is where we see why sinners want to hang out with Jesus. because He doesn't, he doesn't cast judgment on them. He says, I didn't come here to condemn. He also didn't let them do what they want to do. It's here where he has compassion and grace and mercy and what that looks like. Again, that we are called to take a stand. The question is how? The question is, okay, personally, what is it like for me to move forward, to gain influence with those who are far from the Lord? Because I do believe, like, I believe that, that, that Daniel goes to the classes about the occult and goes about the classes about these false gods. And he throws up his mouth a little bit when they start talking about other gods because he knows it's not true. That Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they go to the King Nebuchadnezzar 101 and just talking about how great he is and you know, he's, he's, he is a God himself, and they just kind of roll their eyes because they know it's not true. And that you're going to be put in places, and yeah, you may have to work for uh, someone who doesn't believe like you. That you may have to be in a class where people don't agree with you. That what, what will be our response when we are not comfortable, when we have to take risk, when, when there are things that are, um, that are not easy for us, but we're in a position to point People to Jesus. God says, yes, you know what? I gave that guy a promotion over you. Am I still good? Yeah. Because guess what? That's where you're going to be able to point him to Jesus the best. Yeah, I did get that neighbor who, who, who is far from me and lives like a pagan and cusses like a say, you know, and plays their music really loud beside you. But I pointed to them. I, I wanted that pagan next to a believer. Don't build an eight-foot fence and never talk to him. God might be putting pagans around you, so that you can show him Jesus. What does that look like in your life? Again, wisdom and discernment. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed 
of a hope in Jesus. Because when we are transformed and not conformed, man, it allows us to reach that neighbor. It allows us to reach that boss. It allows us to reach that student or that uh, athlete that we play with. It allows us to do that when we're not in power and we don't have the influence. So two really th- quick things I want us to take away with. One, that we need to get to back to the basics. Back to the basics. So when we talk about hopeless, being hope in a hopeless, hopelessly broken world, that we got to get back. It's just simply praying. Just simply living a life of obedience, just simply loving your enemies. Odd, right? That's what Jesus tells us. To love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, love your neighbor as yourself. To be in God's word, that we would, we would, we would continue to, to be in that. We got to get back to the basics. We, we don't need to pay attention to the skirmishes that, that Satan distracts us so much with. We just need to get back to the basics and live our life for him. And that's the truth, and that's the foundation. Can I tell you, in a, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, reading your Bible, praying before meals, you know, your, the idea of marriage, a Christ-centered marriage, or the idea that you gave money away or that you're radically generous, that was normal in a Christian society. Can I tell you now, nothing's changed, but now it's weird, different, radical. That you would live your life that way? That you would give that much money to Haiti? That you would volunteer your time, the idea that you would forgive your spouse for what they did, radical, that's different. That you would raise your kids in such a way that respect and honor authority, no. The idea that we would read our kids' Bible verses and that we would have memorization and we'd ask each other how our day is going, man, it's so different. That you'd be financially responsible and not die in, in your head in debt crazy. Back to the basics that used to be normal but are so radical now. Are you willing to be radical? Are you willing to be different and stand out? Not be conformed to the world? Transformed by the hope of Jesus? That's the question we have to ask. Does your life look different than your lost neighbor? No, not really. Other than Sunday morning, not really. We pretty much talk the same and watch the same things and Man, we pretty much do the exact same life other than Sunday morning. I'm here and they're not. Make your decisions differently because of Christ. And the next, last, is the power of community. <laughs> Daniel needed his friends. I think there's a reason why it just not wasn't Daniel. But he says, look, it was me and my boys. We were, we were riding four deep and God told us to do this and he gave us the courage because community is important. The disciples, they needed each other. Paul needed Barnabas. Titus needed Titus and Timothy needed Paul. That community is important. The early church and Acts needed each other. That we need to help each other in struggle. That we need each other to hold us accountable. We need each other to, to cheer each other on in the fight. That's the plan of the, the church. That's the plan of the Lord. That God said, look, I'm going to, Jesus says, I'm going to leave. But the Holy Spirit's going to come. The Holy Spirit's going to knit your souls together. And you're going to help each other and serve one another and greet one another. And you're going to worship together. And you guys are going to continue. The power of community is going to push back the darkness, even in a pagan culture. That there's going to be the 601 Fairy Street, and, and there's going to be these churches, these little lighthouses in a dark, hurting world. So that we have to have community because we correct one another, we encourage one another, we, we remind each other of the goodness of the Lord, we strengthen one another. The world's going to tell you you don't need the church. Even now, we're seeing people just kind of fade away because they've gotten out of the routine and they're, they're not engaged in community anymore. And we're seeing, man, we're seeing marriages crumble. We're seeing kids just go crazy. I really have no doubt that it is, it, it is because we're not in community with brothers and sisters. We're, we're not bringing Christ to the center of our homes. And we're allowing us just to fade into the rest of Babylon. Because we don't have community. We're not linking arms. We're not allowing the Holy Spirit to knit us together. That's why I'm so encouraged by you guys and that throughout the summer, like Carly said, we've seen new faces and new families. And, and, and we have some people who are still don't feel comfortable coming back, which is fine, but they're engaging us through technology, through the app. They're engaging us through, um, through all the things that we've got going on. But the idea of going, hey, what does it look like not to just fade off into the distance and conform to the world as Ro- do as Rome, do as the Romans? life for to be in the middle of going, hey, how can I show grace to one another? How can we encourage one another? So we got to get back to the basics and we've got we to understand what it looks like to be in community. So here's your big idea. If you're new to Capstone, we always try to give a big idea and it's simply this, is that we will be conformed, will we be conformed to this world that we are living in or will we be transformed by the hope of this world, which is only King Jesus? 
Can I tell you that Satan goes, you know what? You don't need the church. Your hope can be in a politician. Your hope can be in Wall Street. Your hope will be in social reform. Your hope will be in an economic plan. Our hope can be in nothing but Christ and Christ alone. And that's what we see with Daniel and we see with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know what? My hope isn't in a jailer, whether they say yes or no. My hope isn't in King, King Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to see that King Nebuchadnezzar tries to kill three of them. We're, we're going to see that time and time again, there's going to be tests. And, and man, sometimes the Lord, we go through tests and he doesn't prevent us from the test, but he walks with us in the test. But the idea that, man, will I be conformed to look more like this world I look more and more like this pagan and dark culture that I'm living in, full of hate, full of destruction, full of anger. I still just label it Christian. Or will we be full of humility, compassion, and grace, and mercy? Because that's, that's how Jesus dealt with this broken world. The hope that we bring. So what is, that land, what is that line in the sand for you to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by this hope? And I have no doubt that you get that from getting back to the basics, being in prayer, being in scripture, being in community, sharing the gospel in word and deed, growing in Christ, loving your enemy, forgiving those who've harmed you or hurt you. When you do that and then you live in community together, man, what is an overflow is not garbage, it's goodness. So when goodness comes in, goodness comes out. Sucking in the garbage of this world, or do we bring it? We have a choice. Do you bring in the negative negativity of the culture that surrounds us, or do you bring in the goodness of the Lord that He calls us to share as His church? Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now, thankful that our hope is not in ourselves, but our hope is in a risen Savior. That our, that our hope is in Christ who, who goes to the cross, who defeats Satan's sin and death, and, and he models what it looks like to be in a hopelessly broken world. He says it's, it's simply loving the unlovable. It's through humility and service and compassion and grace. So I pray if any of us in here have a hard heart, Lord, that you would break that hard heart. That if we've we've gotten angry about us losing power, that if we've got consumed with the ways of the world, God, that that you would just, (laughs) that we wouldn't look like just angry Christians because too many of my brothers and sisters look angry. But we would be filled and look more like Jesus. But I also pray for those who are on the other side, uh, that they, they've just kind of soaked in the rest of the world and go, man, I can do whatever I want and, and went in Rome doing the Romans. But Lord, I pray that whatever line they need to draw, Lord, that they, that they would draw it. Whatever they're over-consuming of this world, that you would convict them and the Holy Spirit would just stir inside of them. That is the beauty of the Holy Spirit, that when we ask to convict that you are faithful to do that. So Lord, right now, who's watching online who are and who are soaking this in here, uh, Uh, here at Capstone in the building, Lord, that you would convict us, whatever area that may be, to not be conformed to this world, but God, we'd be transformed by the hope of this world in Jesus. Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you, I pray that they would, if they've been conformed and they've tried all the things of the world for self-medication and has brought them happiness and they still feel emptiness, Lord, I pray that you would right now, that you would just put inside of them the door, the knocking of Christ that says, I am here. But we just simply need to accept that free invitation of salvation and that we would, again, be sanctified as we have been justified. We'd be sanctified more and more into the image of Christ. I thank you for my capstone family. I thank you for what we are doing here. And that, again, that we would be continued not to see, be conformed to this world, but how we continue to shine brighter and brighter so that it can be transformed by you, Jesus. In your son's holy name. We are so excited that you have joined us this morning in worship with our Capstone family. Uh, Our big idea today was this. Will we be conformed by this world we are living in, or will we be transformed by the hope of this world, Jesus? The idea of garage in and garbage out isn't new, but it's one that can really help in how we respond and to what the world throws at us. What could you do this week to ingest more gospel-centered content in order to respond with a more gospel-centered way uh, in situations that you face? If you would like more follow-up questions um, and some scripture, please check out our digital discipleship gathering insights to learn more. 
Um, we would love to get connected with you as well. You can check us out on our social media platforms um, or our website, capstonechurch.net. But hope you guys have a great week and you are sent out. Bye.